Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I'm battling a cold, so if you can't hear me in the back, throw a muffin at me or something. Um, thank you very much for coming this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, as was said, I'm, my name's Gary Gregoris. I've been with Mattamy for uh, close to 10 years, and I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of what Mattamy does, because many people in the room may not know, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about the land development process 101 at least from a community's builder's perspective. Uh, we are on a business in the environment in which you're talking, so it has dramatic consequences on business dealings that we make every single day. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about Seton, and there's some people in this room who've probably been involved in Seton. It's been on the planning books for close to 30 years, and hopefully soon to be developed, but it's been a long, long haul, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I have some closing remarks. Sorry, I should have gone to that slide second. Obviously, you know I don't do this for a living. Um, so who is Mattamy Homes? Mattamy Homes is a privately owned building company that was founded in 1978. <clears throat> Started out as a custom home builder in the city of Burlington. Since that date, we've built uh, close to 50, over 50,000 homes. And I'd like you to remember this point because I'm gonna come back to, to it at the end of the presentation. We operate primarily in the GTA, but we have housing divisions in Calgary, Ottawa, and five U.S. markets. And I want to talk a little bit about it at the end. And we currently employ 750 people directly, and probably thousands, tens of thousands indirectly through our trades and sub-trades. So I know Joe Vaccaro spoke to you a little bit yesterday about the land development process. Um, I'm going to speak to it, as I said, from, from our perspective of having to live through it day to day and what the decisions are when we get involved in a, in a public process and then a process that requires us to uh, evaluate everything from, uh, from trees to, to flora, fauna, to also good community design as well as sustainable development standards. And I talked to you a little bit about the timelines because the timelines that Joe indicated to you yesterday are real and we're going to talk to you in theory and then I'm going to show you a seat and example and show you how long it takes actually from us by the time we acquire the land till we close a house because when we close a house that's the only time we get paid to be quite crass and honest with you so this example is um, land acquisition I started with the year 2000 because it's going to tie into my my presentation a little longer when we buy land sometimes we buy land inside what's called an urban boundary and sometimes we buy land outside an urban boundary. And obviously, if it's outside an urban boundary, it comes with significant risk. Sometimes you buy greenbelt, and sometimes you buy development land. And that's just the high-risk nature of the business. The next step in the planning process, and this is a really high level, is what I call a growth management exercise. Uh, many of you know that there's been a new growth plan put in place. Following from the growth plan, you have to do official plan conformity exercises. Most municipalities do urban boundary expansion studies. Usually, there's someone who's not too happy. It ends up at the Ontario Municipal Board. And we're six to eight years down the road. And if you think my example's wrong, Mr. Beeman's here. He makes a living at the Ontario Municipal Board. Um, we have most regional official plans now tied up at the, uh, at the Ontario Municipal Board. Halton hasn't even started. Durham just finished, York's in the process, Kitchener, Waterloo's finished, but they've appealed it to the courts. So the entire planning process that I'm speaking about is hung up either in the courts or through the process of a conformity exercise. Now I'm trying to operate a business, and we have thousands of people employed, and we're trying to have an even flow of production, just like Ford Motor Company. We want to be able to deliver a certain number of units every year, and the only commodity we have to deliver those units is land. So we struggle to bring lands to market. After you are lucky enough to get your lands inside an urban boundary, uh, the municipalities do what's normally called a secondary plan. I don't know how many planners in the room. I'm sure most of you have been involved in one, though. And this is really where the rubber starts to hit the road for us. This is where we start looking at how the community is going to be laid out. We also start evaluating through, uh, there's acronyms up there, MESPs, FSRs, Master Environmental Servicing Plans. And really that's where we do a ton, a ton of work on monitoring, assessing, four season inventories of flora, fauna. And really that takes 
typically three to five years. It actively involves municipalities. It actively involves conservation authorities. They are, in my opinion, part of the gatekeeper of the process. MNR gets involved. I don't know if Tom's here, Mr. Farrell, but he's involved in two big communities that I was involved with in both North Oakville and Brampton. They're all involved in this process. So you can see how long it takes us just to get to what's called a secondary plan. And we can't go to sale yet. The next step in the process for us is what's called draft plan approval. Draft plan approval is the only time we can legally sell a house. And I'm probably 11 to 15 years in process and I haven't even started my sales program yet. And then I have two to three years, because generally speaking, we have to do EAs for roads and pipes to bring external services to the door. And then I have one to two years to actually build the internal roads, parks, schools, et cetera. And then I have to actually build the house. So that takes close to a year. So I'm somewhere between 15 and 22 years away from development. And you think if I'm exaggerating, I'm going to show you an example. I'm not. I've done this for many, many years, and I know three, three communities that I could use this as an example, North Oakville being one of them. So here we have the, the meters running. The meters running when we bought the land in 2000. And we are now 15 years of, of interest and mortgage on top of that property. You can understand how expensive the land process becomes, and ultimately, it's you and I that suffers because it ends up being passed on to the house home buyer, and it ends up being passed on to that business. So we have an affordability issue that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Many of you have probably have never been through the land development process, so I want to give you an example. So I'm going to show you, if in a greenfield setting, a 100-acre uh, parcel of land, and what happens through the process, and how much of it's actually set aside for what I call a public taking. Some of it's required. <laughs> but some of it is negotiated, and that's generally speaking the first component. And that's your NHS. NHS, in my experience, averages around 30%. Seton, which is a provincial plan, is around 50%. This is the trees, this is the valleys, this is the floodplains. And then there's some, I'll call it, negotiated components of, the, of an NHS, and that would be the linkages and the buffers. And we have several debates lengthy, sometimes at the Ontario Municipal Board, as to how big that green is. But out of every 100 acres, at least 30 acres is being set aside for green on average. Next comes the roads. Well, that's usually around 20, could be higher in neo-traditional plans, but that's around 22% in my experience. So I'm at 52% set aside for public use. Stormwater management ponds, they've been creeping and getting larger and larger. As we go to regional storm controls, they've gone from 5%. I've used 7 but I've seen them as high as 10% set aside. So storm ponds do have an impact on how much land's remaining to be developed. 2% is your schools, your high schools, your community centers, your fire, police, ambulance, all necessary requirements of, a, of building a complete community. That's the 2%. Remaining lands is 34%. So 66% of 100 acres, or 66 acres out of every 100, goes to some use that goes to the public eventually. And 34% is set aside to actual develop. You can, I think you can understand why we get a little ornery when we get at the back end of the process and we're being asked for more takeout. We've just spent 15 to 20 years going through a process, we've set aside at least a third of the land for environment plus others, and then at the, at the last end of the, pro, or at the back end of the process, we're being put in a position where we, we, we're, we're negotiating additional takeouts. And we're trying to operate a business, as I said, because we have uh, uh, commitments made to people to, uh, to keep on operating their businesses. So hopefully that gives you a context. Um, don't want to sound too draconian, but I'm the developer, and that's what we do for a living. Seaton. I'll just leave the I'll just leave the the uh, the, the that um, schedule up for now, and I'll speak to my words because there's a lot of words associated. But Seaton's a. If any of you were involved in the Oak Ridges Marine, which I was, uh, um, these lands for the most part were part of the land exchange between the province 
and um, the private landowners that owned what was called the pinch point in the Oak Ridge and Moray, basically between Maple at Young Street. And these lands were exchanged uh, between ourselves and the province in and around 2000. I'm probably off by a, a year or two, but in and around 2000. And Seton is very big. It's about 3,000 hectares, or about uh, 7,500 acres. As I said earlier, about 50% of it has been set aside for a natural heritage system. And it's planned to accommodate 70,000 people and 35,000 jobs. Probably is gonna take beyond 31 to build it out. And here's, here's where I'm really getting sort of the crux of the, the issue and what I understand has been talked about and a lot of things that Ian spoke about is we, we, we the landowners, prepared a, a very comprehensive master environmental servicing plan. And you can appreciate when you're doing it across a big areas as, as Seton is, that it's going to be voluminous, it's going to be uh, very technical, and it is very large. Dina can attest to that. It's probably five, six volumes this, this high. And that was submitted uh, to the TRC and others in, I think, 2011, end of 2011. And when we did the assessment, well, not me, but our, our technical team, um, obviously there were species at risk that were already identified, but when the list keeps on changing down the road, and we've already spent, I'm gonna say millions of dollars, not hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in doing this work, to find out that there's been another species that wasn't identified or anticipated at when we started the process. And not that you have to start it over again, but you have to keep on working. And, and it's almost like you're chasing your tail in the, in the process, which, which becomes impossible for us to finalize it. If we don't draw a line, line in the sand, and it's almost impossible to actually get an approval. Um, the good news is, oh, sorry, the other thing I like to point about Seton is if you, if you think about it, it's 3,000 hectares, and there's a whole bunch of uh, infrastructure required. A lot of it's going to be regional infrastructure. So the region of Durham's going to build it, and a lot of it's going to be uh, developer-built infrastructure. But they all require permits. So the coordination and permitting process for 3,000 hectares is going to be, um, I think, one of a kind in the province. And uh, I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's great we're talking to MNR, maybe not soon enough, but the fact that the door is open and we're discussing how we're gonna approach this issue is, 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 is great. But we can't, we can't keep on changing the process at the back end. And for me, the secondary plan's the back end. I just spent 15 years getting to the secondary plan and now we still haven't finished and it will never finish because I'm not draft approved or I'm not registered or I'm not building homes and roads. So that's probably part of the big um, issue or challenge that the industry faces when dealing with the uh, ESA. So there are possible solutions. I'm sure I've just highlighted, oh sorry, I've just highlighted three, but for the planners in the room, I guess, Anytime you look and make a planning decision or you're building a complete community, there's really three pillars. There's three pillars in the planning process. There's the, the environment, the economy, and there's the social aspects of developing a community. And I think, unfortunately, the ESA, because of its very nature, upsets that balance. The environment trumps, and the other two, in my opinion, suffer. And I think that leads to bad decisions. And it's not what's contemplated in our planning documents. It's not what's contemplated in our growth plan. Because I think the economy always sits at, at the back burner of, of these decisions. And, the, and I've heard environment first principles well, since the Oak Ridge is Marine, and they usually win. And I think that leads to, um, uh, unfortunately, um, some decisions that I, I don't think uh, are, are bode well for our future. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I think transition is a key to the implementation of the ESA. I think we have to stop moving the bar. I think we have to set a line in the sand and let us at some point in time say, okay, we've got to move forward now because I don't think we'll ever be able to um, get out from underneath that. And I think Ian talked about it and I, I, I welcome those comments that we need a more um, streamlined and predictable mitigation process I wasn't too enamored with what he was talking about, the let's make a deal kind of process, because we just made a deal 15 years ago by giving up 30% of the land. And the let's make a deal will never stop. 
So I'm, I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm, 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 we've done it because <laughs> we have to move on with our business, but I just don't like it at the back end of the process. The other thing I was thinking about, which is, uh, I don't know if anyone else, and I didn't put it up on this slide, but when I was driving in today, uh, we have a provincial facilitator's office, um, Paul Dill, many of you may know. Dale Martin used to be really good at it, and I was also I was thinking, we need a champion. We need a champion when the industry hits a wall with this stuff, and uh, and we need someone who I think can break through the log jams, and maybe that's a, a suggested solution that we have someone, whether it's an M and R, or in the provincial facilitator's office themselves, who can help us break the log jams, because um, we have too many jobs, too much uh, uh, economic stimulus at risk to be sitting and waiting. My closing remarks. Um, please recognize that lands in the improved and improved urban boundaries are a limited resource and are non-renewable. And many people don't treat it that way in the process, and I'd really like to drive home that point. The land and development approval process in Ontario is complex, lengthy in experience. It is not conducive to doing business. And I have a prediction that it's going to choke out all the smaller organizations, all those small entrepreneurs, all those smaller home builders. This isn't their core business. They can't and don't have the wherewithal or the ability to deal with this kind of uh, complicated process. We will choke them out. I, and, you know, it's great for one of the bigger developers to say, you know, no competition, but I don't think that's healthy. We all need a job and we all need a place to live. And when the smaller entrepreneurs are choked out because the process is too complicated, Houston, I think we've got a problem. Obviously, this transit delay translates into additional costs. If we buy land in 2000 and we don't close a house in 216, that cost goes somewhere and it goes to you, you the consumer. And it's reflected in our high house prices. You don't have to read the papers too much to understand that housing affordability for first time buyers or others is going to be and is about beyond the stretch of most people. Last time, and also the other thing um, many of you probably don't know, but the housing starts, at least for grade related product, house single detached homes, has fallen significantly in the last 10 years. And that's not because the market's not there. Sure, there's change in policy that we should be growing up and not out, and no one's opposed to those, nor are we. But, pro but the biggest problem is that we can't bring the communities to market. I just gave you an example of Seton, I could talk to you about Brampton, I could talk to you about North Oakville, I could talk to you about Aurora. These have all been land holdings that we've had, most of it was bought inside the urban boundaries, so there wasn't even a risk there. We just can't bring the, market, the land to market, and part of it is the responsibility of the people in this room, including myself. If we don't work together, we're, we're in a serious world of hurt. I don't think it's sustainable either. I think if we continue down this path, what we're doing is we're putting housing beyond the reach of most people. Most people's incomes haven't increased over this period of time, but the house price has. And I think they're spending more and more on less accommodation, which I think is really ri uh, risky. And I, I think it's going to be a real challenge for our kids and our kids' kids. And the last, last, not my last point, because I do have one more. <laughs> the land development process uh, cannot react to last minute intervention. And what I mean is that after secondary plan, it's, it's like saying to Ford Motor Company, okay, you're producing F-150s, and you've got all these Ford F-150 pickup trucks going down the assembly line, and then someone says, no, 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 no. We want you to do hybrids halfway through the assembly line process. And Ford can't react, nor can we. And that's why I say if we can have more predictable, upfront, um, uh, clear, concise rules on, on the ESA, that would be greatly appreciated from our perspective. I'd finally like to end with a prediction on the next candidate species at risk expected to be assessed by Casero in the not-too-distant future. I say this in joking, but in all seriousness, my, my last point is what I started with, and I'll bring this right home. Uh, we have to start working together. This is a partnership. We're trying to build Ontario, and if we can't build Ontario in a cooperative way, um, what happens, and I, I indicated that Mattamy Homes is looking at five U.S. markets, Calgary, we're already there, and Ottawa, and this is just the start. 
uh, we are investing heavily outside of the province of Ontario. And uh, that is a problem. It's great for us. You can't put all your eggs in one basket, which is what, uh, what we've decided to do. And part of that is good business, but part of it is because we can't bring our communities to market. And I think it's a real, real shame when not only our company, but many of the other leading developers in our province are looking to other opportunities to do business. We're gonna be, as I said, and I don't wanna leave, leave on a completely sober note, somber note, but we're gonna be in a world of hurt. And I don't think it's gonna be helpful for the environment. And I don't think it's helpful for our children and our children's children. Thank you.